Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. A special event today. I can finally talk openly without having to blow an embargo. Oliver Halvin joining us with Leica today. We're talking Oliver's work, and there is an exciting release that has just dropped the Leica SL3. So we'll be weaving that into the mix. Huge thank you to Oliver for joining us and to Leica for hosting today's event. Oliver, how's it going? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Derek? Thanks for having me. No, thanks for joining us. I know we got you up early this morning. You're joining us out from the West Coast. So uh, huge thank you. It's a special time for us. We had to to work this in to make it happen for this release, but uh, we're excited to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's um, it's really great to be here. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about my photography and um, my experiences with, with the SL3. Awesome. So we'll, we'll start it right there. What brought you to photography? What, what got you interested? How long have you been doing it? Where did the uh, journey begin? Um, for me, uh, I started in about 2015, and I I was I started pursuing. I was I was a big fan of music, and I started really in in the music photography space. Um, and for five six years, I was I was working with artists and um, music artists in in different ways, um, shooting artwork and going on tours. Um, and then that evolved for me, and I started moving more towards the fashion world. Um, I was I was looking to expand just visually what I was doing, and then I mean, cut to now, I'm I'm mainly in in the fashion world, but also in the commercial world um, and the documentary world too. With and I still do a little bit of music, but not not so much anymore. But it's been a it's been a long journey over over the last ten years. Where's um, the passion at now? The, sorry. Where's the passion at now? It has fashion taken over? You still have that passion uh, fashion, for music? Fashion's taken over, but also so has so has photojournalism. So, you know, fashion, but, but creating uh, meaningful and impactful stories. Really, really stories. Storytelling has taken over. Interesting. Yeah. So with fashion, I guess it's more of you're creating the story with documentary. It's finding the story or what's the difference between the two for you? Um, I think with uh, with fashion, there's more scope for me creatively. So I get to um, usually work with the client and kind of come in with my input and and have more um, creative creative leverage depending on on what it is and what is the brief. Um, and then with storytelling, I mean, some of my other work, I'm I'm traveling and and um, documenting and and going to different places and and um, capturing real stories and cultures um, and. I think, I mean, that really does tie back into to fashion and what brands strive to do. You know, they'll they'll strive to um, get influence from from different places and and cultures and um, art and bring that back into to their work and their designs. You know, so it it all integrates. Um, I enjoy the different worlds I work within. Interesting. And you do you do all well. I want to point that out. I mean, one of the things that that jumps out about your work is it's so the colors. Your color work is and I don't say this often, there's something about the colors. I mean, color is so emotive and, and there's something about when the colors are right, that it just draws you into the image, the way you see color, the way your images just, just grab you. Is that how you see? I know some people it's just, they don't really see that way. It's just, they happen, things fall in place, but is color really something that jumps out to you or how do you see color versus black and white when you're capturing images? What, draws you um you know for, for me for a long time i i was just taking pictures and, and and really enjoying black and white and um i do love black and white and i think my my um heroes and sort of influence and influ influential people that i look up to in the photography space are mainly black and white photographers um you know and they're like magnum photographers like photographers uh people like elliot erwitt and mary ella mark um and you know, I'd, I'd, and Jim Marshall in the, in the music space and photography it really has a timeless quality in black and white, and I and I do love it. But then I think just due to to the nature of of work and and commissions, I was having to shoot more in color, and then I really in, in started to embrace that over over the years. And I think it's more recently I've become um, a real real stickler with with colors. I'd say in the last well, the last five years. But now, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really, um, really specific with 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 colors <laughs> and grading. I mean, if, and if that's whether I'm shooting with film, um, if I shoot with film, I'll, I'll go and and um, develop my film and then print by hand. So I'll either print by hand myself or I'll have somebody else do it 
for me. But then that's a whole process where you can really fine tune all the different the different hues and the colors. And, you know, if there's like a slight bit of too much magenta in the shadows or it's a little bit too much yellow in the highlights or too blue in the highlights. And, and I really enjoy that process. Um, and I think actually that hand printing process really helped me in my digital process. So really learning how to get into the darkroom with an analog process and spending so long on the specifics of between the, the, the shadow, the midtone, the highlights. Um, then now when I'm editing digitally, um, I'm a, I think I'm a lot more competent in a, in a digital grading space. And actually for, to talk about Leica, the one, one of the main things I, I love actually about Leica and the SL3 is grading. That is probably the, the main thing for me is just compared to any other any other camera brand I've used, there's just so much leverage for for grading colors. But also there's a there's a base color there with Leica that they have, um, which is like it's already perfect in a way. So you've already got a great foundation. You know, if you shoot a great mm -hmm. image that's really well lit, you that file, that raw file already looks fantastic. So it's not you don't actually have to do that much to it, I feel. Compared to compared to other working with other brands and other forms of raw files from other sensors and cameras. Yeah, your baseline is already is already up here. I was hoping I wasn't reading too deep into it because I was looking at your work and it's like, you know, sometimes it's like, am I am I picking things apart? Am I seeing stuff that's not there? But it was your your grading. And, and I'm glad you went into that because I was seeing the hues and the shadows and then the highlights and everything. It's like the perfect way to describe color theory and looking at your work. And we're going to see some in a bit here with these images with the SL3, but um, what, what brought you to the Leica system? Um, what, Leica reaching out to me or me, me, me going to the Leica system originally. Um, I can tell my, my, um, historic story with the Leica system is, um, in actually really before I was taking pictures professionally in about 2009, maybe 2008, 2009, someone bought me a, a dear friend of mine. It's like an uncle, um, bought me a deluxe five. And I don't, the, I think like I still make the deluxe, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, a deluxe five now is the, it's, it's a very old camera. So it's not like, I think my <laughs> iPhone is, is, is higher quality now than a deluxe five, but, um, it's uh, it was an amazing camera at the time. And, and that really inspired me. I mean, I really had that that deluxe five and I would, I would run around and shoot. I would say that was my bridge into, into actual taking pictures professionally. Cause a deluxe is more of a, it's more of a compact point and shoot, but um, I'm not quite sure what model that's on now. I'd have to have a look, but that was my, en that was my entryway into the Leica systems. And then um, since then um, I got to use someone, let me use a monochrome uh, M11 monochrome a lot more recently. Um, and I completely fell in love with that and the whole the whole M system. Um, and the M system for me was, you know, it's it's uh, it's you know, it's a different system. It's it's manual. You're you're focusing manually, but um, I love that you can really slow down and it feels like a lot more. I mean, it is modeled on film cameras, so it is it feels a lot more like you're shooting analog. Um, and then uh, bridging to now on the SL system, I got to use the SL2 uh, last time. I don't have one, but I, I really, really love the SL2. And um, cutting to recently, um, Kieran, who was the marketing manager for Leica, um, contacted me and said that she was, you know, she liked what I was doing um, and she'd be interested in seeing if I'd, if I'd like to take... Um, their new camera, the SL3, on my adventures and, and trips that I had planned because I, I had quite a lot coming up. Um, so then I got my hands on the SL3. And oh, and also, firstly, when Leica contacted me about that, I was very honored because, as I said, all of my my heroes and 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 magnum photography heroes, really, that are, my main influence are all, are all Leica photographers. So it was a big honor for me. Um, and... Yeah, getting the ha getting my hands on the SL3, I was it, it's it's kind of like the perfect camera for me because I, I also shoot video too, so I make I'm I'm film I'm I'm making films now I'm directing films. Um, um, some of them are, have more budget, some of them have lower budget. So sometimes I'm filming everything myself. Um, so it's great to have a camera that is just completely capable in the video space as well, but is also takes phenomenal pictures that are that are really really high megapixels i know that that's the other thing i wanted to wanted to talk about was just the the quality 
of the um the sensor the quality of the the the, the resolution of the files mm -hmm. and it's also compact you know it's not it's not so big and i won't name like other other brands that i've used in the past but it would be i'd have to lug around a lot of kit you know and i'd be traveling and going to places like egypt or where you actually it's hard to bring cameras in you know it's not mm -hmm. it's not that um camera friendly some places some some countries so you, you it's good to go with a more compact kit you know and having something like the sl3 was just fantastic to be able to be able to go to either video or, or images so yeah i was surprised to see i mean they knocked it down i think it's 1.7 pounds and it's noticeably from what i've what i've heard it's noticeably trimmed down from the previous i mean i've shot the the sl2s and i don't mind a little bit of weight i mean a little bit of weight lets me know that it I got a solid camera in my hands. It's good quality, but less weight is always better, especially when you're carrying it around, you're working long hours and, and traveling as you are, you want that, uh, that lighter weight in your hands. The one thing for me that, that stood out, I don't know if this is a big thing for you, but is having that little, the tilting touchscreen LCD. Yeah. Cause it's like, for me, I was like, I never, I never saw it coming, coming with the Leica. Um, you know, I've just gotten used to the, uh, just having the LCD, plastered there on the back but is that a major thing for you yeah for me um i mean yeah the weight thing as well i i think because i had i had an sl2 for a, a while and um borrowed one but the the um the sl2 is noticeably heavier but it is something is with weight i think like if you're if i'm in a studio it just depends you know in the studio it's it's nice to have a bit of weight but then when i'm on the go and traveling it's like especially when you've got to carry gear all, all the time you know it's like it makes such a difference so so yeah um the 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 screen that came out um yeah i think it's it's necessary on the, on the camera and it's a great um improvement on the last one for sure yeah definitely i mean it's not a huge thing for most people but when you learn how to use it and especially with documentary and street as a lot of like photographers are are accustomed to street it just makes everything so much easier you know, if, if I'm not shooting eye to eye, eye to the EVF, um, I can bring it down, drop it to, to you know, chest level, waist level, and, and it just yeah. makes it a little bit easier to function on all those. For me, Leica, there's just something about the look. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what they put in these cameras. There's just something that you can't really describe. I, I've never met anybody that could accurately describe what it is. But when you pull the files up, there's just something to the images that really jumps out. I know there's there's a ton of dynamic range. I think it's 15 stops of dynamic range in the in the SL3 that you're just able to pull so much back into the image and still have it look natural. And in looking at the, your images, it you were you were shooting in brutal sunlight. I could already tell yeah. in in the images that you sent over and the recovery now were you were you shooting with uh with any flash or do you normally shoot with flash or strobes or anything is it mostly natural light for you um i do uh it, it just depends i think the uh -huh. answer to this question is um depends what i'm doing depends on the brief depends what i'm trying to achieve um you know in the studio obviously using flash i do like to use flash on locations sometimes um I did consider bringing flash up. I did two trips with the SL3. So one, I went to Egypt. Um, Egypt was, as I said, it's quite hard to to bring gear there and, and um, especially a lot of equipment. Um, I was on quite a busy schedule. I was visiting pyramids, um, lots of pyramids and ancient sites and ancient temples, um, which also is not, um, yeah, you, you can't bring a lot of equipment into them. So it was good to just have it as compact as possible um so that definitely and i wouldn't there wasn't really a, a um to that sort of work like documentary work i just shoot natural light um then my second trip that was more planned which i have there's a video coming um that i filmed for leica which i'm excited for it to be released um so it's not out now so i think we have to wait a few weeks but then the images that i took that i think you're going to show some will make more sense and the whole story will make sense in the narrative of the video um for that i went to uh to new mexico um new mexico utah arizona and we were working with i collaborated with um indigenous uh fashion designers and artists and dancers creatives um and it was mainly on the um navajo nation reservation 
which is um they'd like to refer as the Dene tribe. That's how they're referred to. Um, and then we were collaborating with indigenous artists from other tribes that came in. Um, and I can talk, I'll give them all a, sh a shout out and, and talk about everyone, give give a talk about everyone that we worked with later. But um, but just for that trip to talk about light for that trip, um, I did consider it. So I considered bringing down um, some sort of like pro photo kind of uh, portable, I think it's the B, I don't know what I have, like portable pro photo B11s or something, but they sync with the camera. They synced with the SR3s perfectly. I was using them in New York for, for more fashion work there um and i considered it but then i thought you know um i'm just going to go natural light for this and i, I didn't want to i knew we had a, a really busy travel schedule so that that was hindering it and i just thought i just wanted to sh like flow and shoot organic and, and kind of work with the the natural light and the, the colors and textures of of life you know and um i did I, I brought a reflect i bought two reflectors so we had some of them were with reflectors but i think most of the images i showed you are just I just naturally lit and and i also thought back to to me as well um like a, it feels more like a camera to to use in natural light for some reason i don't know why i think it's down just because in my head i'm always thinking about history you know <laughs> something and the great pictures that i i love in history are all just like you know naturally lit photographs generally yeah you want the you want the power of the camera to really just flex yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Is the power of the camera flexing, not how good your lighting setup is. It's just, uh, it's, it's just <laughs> I know great. it's almost like too easy. It's just like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like cheating. Um, no, it is, and there is something about like, like I said, with Leica with those files, you know, and and what you said about what it is, you know, uh, the nature of what is it with Leica that kind of elevates it. Um, and I, I was talking to someone the other day, and it's the manager of the New York store. So I'll say shout out to Rob Tyrrell. And we were talking about Leica and what it is and, and the ethos of the brand and why why that does elevate you. Um, and it does. It's like you walk onto a set and you have a Leica and all of a sudden it's like you're elevated to, you know, amongst all the photographers or whoever's there. And, and there is just something. And even just with the image quality, you know, the build quality, but really the image quality, um, it's something else. And I think it's, you know, it's probably due to the fact that they're hand making all their cameras still in or that Leica are hand making cameras in the original factory where they started you know 200 nearly 200 years ago so i believe it's the original factory so like i don't think anyone else is doing that so i'm sure that has a lot to do with it yeah it's just that level of craftsmanship and, yeah. and work that's put in and then as you build the technology out and you know i think when i think of like i think a very simple design and i think with this when you when you see the the autofocus for example what is it you're you're combining uh it's a hybrid autofocus system has phase detection contrast detect and object detection all working together to provide the the most accurate autofocus that you can get and it's little things like that that you take the simplicity of Leica because I've always seen Leica as just simple craftsmanship that's just done really well but the autofocus, this hybrid autofocus system is a perfect example of how you can take technology and not really complicate the simplicity of the, the system, just make it better in ways that it, you need to make it better because we demand it now. Photographers, there's so much technology out there making things better. We, we demand it. We become used to it. And we've gotten away from, you know, the, the manual focus, the, the zone focus. We want to mm -hmm. have the autofocus. We want to be able to pick up a face. We want to be able to pick up a body. We want to be able to pick up subjects, everything. And I think that building out on an already great system, it's a no brainer. You know, this, they took in the SL2, which I think was pretty much a perfect, perfect system and, and made it even better, which is hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the SL2, it, like you said, it's a great camera, you know, and it's hard to make it when you go to, I have the SL3 here, by the way. So, oh, there it is. Which, uh, which lens do you have on there? It's the 24 to 70. Okay. And that's what you used for your project? I, or I was using, um, I've used a lot of different lenses. I, I used um, the 35 um, and the 35 2.0 F2 and the 24 to 90 I was using F4. Um, haven't used this one as much. Um, this one has come to me recently. So I'm looking forward to using this. This wasn't on the project that you, that, um, I shot that I've shown showed you um for Leica. That was the mainly the 24 to 90 
and the 35, but then I also had um, an M Summilux uh, 50 and 35 with the adapter. So I was I was using some of the some of the M lenses as well. Um, so Which, what was the favorite personal favorite that you was your uh, go to? Um, well, I mean me, I'm I they they're good for different things. I love the I love the M lenses because I love that I love the hybrid look of having a, a a camera that looks like this, a modern camera, and then having an a, an a vintage looking lens on it. I just think it's so cool that you can do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I I really enjoyed that. Um, obviously, they're only manual focus, so it limits you a lot. And I kind of shot myself in the foot sometimes because I would be shooting outside in its bright sunshine and, you know, saying Monument Valley. And I'd be shooting with the M and I'd go like really shallow depth of field. And I, and you can't because I was it was manual focus and it's hard in the sunshine. I would get some out of focus pictures. So I would say for it depends what you're doing. But yeah, then I'd switch to the 35 um, 2.0 and that would be great, you know, because then everything was pin sharp. Um, but it's a slightly different look on the on the M lenses. And I, and I like that, you know, mm. um, I think when I wanted to go really shallow, I would switch to those lenses. And when I wasn't when I wasn't thinking so much like that, I would switch to the to the newer lenses, the native lenses. Yeah, there's a million Leica photographers out there right now. Like, what is this guy talking about with autofocus? They love, Leica photographers love that M. The M glass, from what I've heard, is just, it's worth the, you go, you know, I know a lot of Leica photographers that shoot wide open, manual yeah. focus. The risk, the, the reward is worth the risk because it's that good. Absolutely. And, and actually, most of my pictures were shot wide open, like um, <laughs> focus, most of them. But it was, I think, um, what I'm trying to say is when you're on a, on a faster paced shoot like that, where we had three models and like, wouldn't, you know, lots of different looks to shoot. And we had to move, we had to travel. I was doing some of the driving. There was like a limited production and it was, everything had to happen quickly. I didn't have a lot of time on my side. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yeah, I'd say sometimes it's safer to just be, have, have, have an automatic. <laughs> I know it's like you, you don't want to come back and have everything out of focus. You want to get something, but yeah, but um, but no, but it is it is worth it. And and I think mm -hmm. from, from that trip and what I shot, there's like some examples that are just just phenomenal that that are wide open, you know, mm -hmm. on the other. So that is the magic of like a really in essence. Now on the video and did you shoot a lot of video out there or no? I did. Um, I want to give a uh credit to my DOP who worked with me, collaborated with me on this on this shoot with uh, Joe Cami. And he was fantastic because we put the production together pretty, pretty last minute. Um, and there was a very small crew. So we, it was quite a, um, we, it was quite an ambitious production, quite an ambitious task. Um, I flew to New Mexico and then I connected with Amy, Amy Danette Dior um, of For Kinship, which is her brand. Uh, Amy and I met um, last year on a shoot and really connected. And I'd always wanted to, to work with her. Her story is really inspiring. Uh, Amy for Kinship is like an umbrella brand that um, uh, is works with upcycled textiles and also looks after creatives, um, indigenous creatives throughout the reservation. Should it could there be skateboarders or designers or artists or dancers and. Amy has a number of um, foundations, and um, one is one is a, the Diné Skate Garden, which is a skate park which she built on a, on the reservation. She got funding for to build on a reservation on a Navajo reservation um, to give the 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 young people and the, the kids of the community some something to do, something to inspire them, and something to skate. Um, so, what I wanted to do was connect with Amy and um, work in a route that was going through the different sacred kind of national parks, but they're sacred sites and also part of the reservation and um, photograph uh, her, some of her clothes and photograph the artists that she collaborates with. So there we had, um, uh, we had Luca, who is a, a, a singer and, and model and artist who was collaborating with us. Um, we had, Tan Povi Martinez, um, who is an, an indigenous dancer um, and um, model as well. And then um, Sean, a guy called Sean Shine Harrison, um, who is a skateboarder, 
a famous skateboarder from the area and skateboarding instructor who, who teaches the, the kids there. Um, so it was uh, different, different characters. Um, and we were trying to go through the different um, sites, different areas, which all have different colors and textures. So Monument Valley is very red, um, very red and orange. And then we went to other another place called Bistai, Bistai Wilderness Area, which is very kind of white and like really interesting rock formations. Um, and then we went to the skate park. Um, I also went to um, a school and I did a talk actually, and I, I haven't told anyone about this, but we went to a school on the reservation, stayed the night um, in a boarding school. And I did a talk about photography to the kids in the morning, which was nice to do in the middle awesome. of filming the whole production. Um, but really this whole, that whole trip was over three or four days. And um, it really was uh, putting the camera through its paces and, and us. So it was really, it was me and me and Joe, my DOP, um, and then the rest of the creative team. And then the drives are really long. So we would, we went from Santa Fe in New Mexico and we drove to Monument Valley, which is on the border of Arizona, Utah and New Mexico. Um, and that was a, a 10 hour drive. So we drove for 10 hours um all across the landscape so it was nice we would like share the driving and then I, I would I would take pictures out the window as well so it was nice like taking pictures of all the landscapes as it was changing and then when we got to the national park um which is actually it's a it's a reservation um monument valley so we thankfully got permission um from um an indigenous native who lives there to to be able to take pictures on their land and um monument valley is just was just phenomenal and um it's it, just like nothing i've ever seen but yes we did we shot a lot of video so um hours and hours of video on on the sl2 and the sl3 um but yeah when it's all released you'll see it so it's a i have a, have a video that i'm quite proud of oh, i can't out. wait to see it with means. the whole trip so i, I think I've, I've explained most of it but you'll 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 it'll kind of get a full understanding when the video drops yeah definitely can't wait to watch that video i mean 8k ProRes 1080p, I think it's uh, up to 8K. All the frame rates, quality settings, record internally, externally without limit. Um, ProRes 422HQ recording. Um, I mean, it's it's holding up its weight to anything else that's out there at, at this level of a camera. You're getting a 60 megapixel full frame camera with up to 8K recording. I mean, what can't you do with it? It's, it's kind of everything you need, right? Yeah, it's everything you need, yeah. Um, and it was, you know, from what we were doing, we'd go, we'd start before sunrise. So before sunrise, it was like really, really low light. And then we'd go, it'd be freezing cold because New Mexico, it was in January. New Mexico in January is really cold. Um, and I thought it would be warm because it's a desert, but no, it gets freezing. <laughs> and, um, but we were lucky because we had a, we had a, a little break because usually we wouldn't have been able to shoot at all. So that we were, mm -hmm. we were blessed that it, we got like a break in the snow and the storms. Um, and it was, it was kind of somewhat sunny, but still we, we stayed the night in Monument Valley um, in a traditional indigenous dwelling, which is called a Hogan. So we stayed in a Hogan on the first night and in the Hogan, it doesn't have, um, it's, there's no electricity, there's no running water, no power. So it was just a stove in the middle that we use for, for warmth. Um, so to talk, to talk about putting the camera for its paces I, I i slept we slept <laughs> in monument valley which was very very cold it got it got warm in the hogan but then in the morning when we came outside it was like minus temperatures you know and then um from when the sun came up it got really hot so it got middle of the day it was like really brutal sunshine um and extremely dusty so obviously you're in a a big sandy desert so there was a lot of dust and very fine dust mm. so i think in terms of um putting the camera through its paces and and in that sense it was it was amazing because dust proof you know went and lasted all the different temperature fluctuations you know perfectly you said if like is going to send me out here i'm going to make sure i test every single thing out the weather <laughs> ceiling yeah. the, the, the desert you got to to experience the biggest lie of the of the desert everybody thinks it's like hot you know through the night and it's like you'll go from like 10 degrees to 110 degrees within a couple hours yeah and it's also like it, it can be dangerous you know because mm -hmm. i think there the the ozone layer is thinner and even though it was a winter and i don't know if it's the sort of so like a it's a british thing we're like oh it's sunny it'll be i'll be fine you know <laughs> 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 but um 
but uh, it because it was it was just um very harsh you know the sun was very harsh and i did get burnt <laughs> i was like by the end, of that, by the end of that first day i was like oh no you know and i've got we've got another two days to shoot you know that drains you because you're like you're you're drained energetically as well you know so the camera held up better than you did the camera held up better than i did yeah by the end of the by the end of the three days the camera looked a lot better than i did <laughs> <laughs> look i want to pull up some images because we've been talking about it but it, it'll be nice to put some uh some sure. visual reference to it. Let's go full screen here. So I'm guessing this is Egypt. This is Egypt. Um, I did uh, well, a week in Egypt in December. And um, I went uh, December. I hadn't been there in the winter before. Usually I've been to Egypt a lot. I've, I've done a, phot a photography book on Egypt, a photo book on Egypt. So I'm very, very well versed and, and, um, and spent a lot of time there actually um but i went there in december which was the first time i've been there in that month and it was egypt in december it's not as hot but it's very overcast um and it doesn't it doesn't get um sunny in the morning so it wasn't when i was there so i was sort of there with the sl3 and i was like getting up for sunrise like okay let's go you know like going out first thing in the morning at like 7 6 a.m and it would just be overcast for for hours um, but then on the last two days we had sunshine. So that's when I took these pictures and I, I like this because this is actually in the, the Giza pyramid complex. There's, there's three pyramids. So that you can see everyone thinks this one in the middle is the main pyramid. It, it isn't. The main pyramid is actually the one on the far right in the distance. That's the great pyramid, which is the biggest. Um, the great pyramid is, is far bigger than the other two. It's the biggest pyramid ever created that we know of on earth. Um, and everyone thinks the pyramid, the second pyramid is the, is larger and that's because they built it on higher ground. So it's actually the, the great pyramid is built on lower ground. This one's built a bit higher. And then where I'm sure what the reason I like this picture is because I'm taking this from the third pyramid. So this is just the, the outside courtyard of the third pyramid, which is the pyramid of Menkura, Menkara. Um, and it's a, it's a much, much smaller pyramid, but yeah, mm. it was, it was nice. I really loved the. The colors I had a I had an ND filter on here, by the way. So just I love to, to blue in the sky. Yeah, and 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 it's little things like that, like the tonality in the sky. You mm -hmm. really, when you take a picture and you have that range of colors, if you look down at like the the to the right of the pyramids, where it's like almost like that orange hue to the sky, going up to the deep blue mm -hmm. at top, it's like it's just such a smooth gradation there, and it really shows the the quality of the sensor and and i've seen some really good cameras that can you get a little banding and sometimes it's it's not as smooth this is just a really nice gradation and tonality there yeah yeah i agree yeah this is the same as what you're saying but you can see you can see more of it yeah you know? uh, i just felt, and also the the um I don't know how much we can see it through the screen on zoom but just uh the sharpness that's what i love this is so sharp. I know I haven't, I haven't, this is when I really, when I used the SL3 and I came back and after this trip, when I was taking pictures like this and kind of zooming in, I was just realizing how, oh my God, how this is, this is so sharp. Everything's pin sharp. You know? um, and there's just so much to work with, so much detail. Um, like I said, color wise. Yeah. I was going to say zoom it probably isn't the best way to view anything, but I already know from using the SL, SL2, that the image quality when you pull this up, especially at 60 megapixels, it's just a ridiculous amount of information there and the detail. I'm I'm guessing all the way back to to the people right in front of the pyramid is just insanely sharp. Absolutely. Yeah, everything. Like you could zoom in on each on each brick in in this picture, even in on the pyramid in the Great Pyramid in a distance too. It's wild. Wow. wow. This this was yeah, this was the morning. Um Again, this was like one of those overcast mornings where the sun just came out. So it was like overcast into sunshine. And, and um, yeah, it was a beautiful morning at the, at the Sphinx um, and uh, just in front of the temple in front of the Sphinx. And it was nice. You'd hear like you'd stand there and you'd, all the birds would fly behind the pyramid and you'd hear the, the call to prayer kind of go off behind you. It was a really beautiful setting. Wow. This is um, uh, this is the 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 red pyramid. This is the red pyramid. So 
The Red Pyramid is um, interesting because it has the the deepest chamber in out of what, any of the pyramids. Um, and you can, I think it's 200 meters you're crawling to, to get to the bottom chamber of that, which is like a very, you get to the bottom chamber of that and it's much bigger than being inside of the the other, the bigger Great Pyramids. But um, this was just the moment we came out. So it was like, you're, you're crawling for like 40 minutes to get into the chamber and then you have to crawl out. And it's it's not for the claustrophobic because you can only go one at a time and you have to be on your hands and knees. And I, I was even quite, I do a lot of, you know, I'd go to a lot of places and, and um, to climb things but and, and go you know go go into temples and climb different things and and but uh this was scary for me but uh yeah this was the moment we came out and then so the next picture this is going into new mexico um this is bistai Bist wilderness area um awesome. bistai Bist wilderness area this was picture i think was on the sl3 with the 50 mil m lens the summer locks i believe uh, this, this um just really interesting rock formations there so it was something i think it's like clay so it, it's always changing it's kind of like a, a, a rock mix mixed with mud and clay so these these shapes would always change and then they, it rains a lot so it erodes in the weather so i think whenever you go it's always going to look different which is pretty fascinating um and it's really hard to it's quite hard to get to it takes a long time so um that was really nice that we did uh uh, like a a fashion shoot there so it was um it felt special like a really really unique location this is where that dynamic range shines it's like you have yes. such a it's you go from white you know almost white formations with the sun beating down on it to even into the shadows it's like if i zoomed in here mm -hmm. you know you're still going to get detail mm -hmm. down into the shadow ranges which is awesome yeah. And again, I think this image, I haven't, I haven't done that much to it edit wise. Yeah. This is just, um, just, this was another, this is a, sh a shallow, uh, what shooting wide open. And, um, this was with the M lens too. Um, this was, this was Sean shines, the skateboarder who came and modeled for us afterwards. So he's a, a great person. See, this Very is where talented. you can see why, why people use the M. -Lens. There's just something about it. There's just such a character to the look. Yeah, it's what it's it's very it's cinematic, you know. I mm -hmm. I think that's when as when I've started using Leica and EM lenses, I'm like, this is just very cinematic, and it and it is completely unique to anything else, like you said. Yeah, can't even describe it. Uh, this is Sean as well. This was in the skate park. I just again, I just like this lens because of the the focus the 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 picture because of the focus, and there's a whole series that kind of make more sense in the story for these, mm -hmm. which are in the video um but uh yeah i, I think you can, i love the the look that's awesome yeah sean on on his ramp um and that was it's this is a beautiful skate park because it's really it's in just in a small town which is off to the right and then there's just nothing you know there's just this is the reservation land and sacred land and open desert and then this is a uh i believe two gray hills which is a sacred rock, I think. I don't I make sure I might have, might have got that wrong, but I think that's what it is behind. So it was nice to have that sacred rock behind him. This was in Monument Valley. Um, just one of the one of the pictures we took in Monument Valley. But yeah, really love the tonality. Yeah, it's, the colors. Are yeah, beautiful. This is in Monument Valley too. So this was a. Um, just a big pool of water that we discovered in the middle of the, in the middle of the park. Um, we went, we were, sh we were mainly using the location kind of like 300 meters to, to the right of this image. And then we decided to walk to see to, for some different, um, some different looks and different locations. And then we came across this pool of water. So we did a whole series here, which was really nice because when the sun hit it, there was this whole change in color and hue. So it would, the sun hit it and it was blue, but then it went to, to pink. Because it was it was ref reflecting with the the orange and the blue of the sky, the orange of the land and the blue of the sky. But yeah, it was very interesting. And, it's just crazy yeah. too when you look in the background and it's like just the detail, the little nuances where you don't have any haloing, you don't have any. It's like artifacting. It's just nice crisp detail, even all the way to the back edge of the image. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
this was in Monument Valley too. That's so again, informative. One of my favorite shots right there out of everything. Oh, I love it. Just the the juxtaposition, you know, with her with the the tree and that. We oh yeah, light. really love that tree. We 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 created a lot of imagery around that tree. It was the only tree there actually. Oh really? Yeah, I didn't I didn't see it on the tree. That was in the morning. This was in the morning, so you can see the lights different. Um, just as the sun had come up behind, and we did a whole series here with this with this beautiful look, um, um, and white dress, um, with the sun coming through and playing with like silhouettes and the sun behind. Just so it was nice. There's other. There's other, I don't know if you have them here, but there's other images that kind of show the dynamic range of the camera. Um, really, with in this this look we shot. Mm. Let's go going back round. Beautiful light. Thank you. Wow, Oliver, man, wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. What's what's the overall impression of the SL three? What uh, what sells you on it? The my overall impression of the SL three. Um, I love it. I'm, I mean, this is for me. Um, but Leica, this is would be is my main go to camera now. You know. Like the M camera, the um, the M eleven is great, and I I love that, but it's um for different purposes, you know. Well, mm -hmm. well but this I think if my main, I'm going to have one camera with me as an all round camera. It'll be the SL three. Um, I, I I love it. As I said, it's the 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 quality of the images and the dynamic range, but also everything I did um of putting it through all these different sort of. I, I don't know how intentional the tests were, but they ended up being tests for the camera. <laughs> All the different things I did, um, and I it shows me it's just a great camera to 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 have with me, just for for everything. I mean, but also I used it, um, and I haven't shared any of these pictures yet. But I used it during New York Fashion Week, so that was a whole different scenario. Um, and yeah, New York Fashion Week, I had it, it was linked to Pro Photos. Used it in a studio. Used it at. Um, a couple of events, um, a couple of uh, shoots I did with with brands um, and influencers, and it was fantastic, you know. So it was just it's versatile. Like I could use it for anything. I actually, I haven't. I don't really um, photograph concerts anymore, um, but I photographed my first concert for over a year, um, which was at Madison Square Garden, and um, I. I took this, so I don't. I, I was like, I haven't, I haven't used a, an SL camera to shoot a concert with before, and I used it, and I was like, it's, it was fantastic, just because the the colors as well. You know, with a concert, there's like, there's a lot of like extreme highlights and and you know and different things going on and strobes and, but it's fantastic, and then you have all the range to adjust everything. Mm -hmm. So, so I can I can safely say that I've used the SL three in like, a lot of different scenarios for everything. And, yeah. and I got to say, I'm so glad you discovered color photography and didn't just stick with black and white because it would have been, it would have been a total disservice. The way you see colors and the way you grade and it's just beautiful. So thank I you just, so much. Um, I, I still I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm in my color era at the moment, but I might have a black and white era <laughs> again. Yeah, we'll forgive you. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a little leeway on there. Now, I want to thank you again for joining us, especially waking up early. I, I apologize for oh, yeah. getting you up at the crack of dawn, but uh, look, I, I think this is worth every minute. It's a, a wonderful system. You did it justice. You put it through the paces. That's what we want to see. We want to see that the cameras hold up to the increasingly uh, difficult demands uh, that we put there. So um, yeah, let's see. We did have a question. Oh, we're going to slip. Yeah, we're going to sl slip a question in here. Uh, Thomas joined us on YouTube. 
Um, isn't there something you can do with the M lenses and a button on the back, maybe autofocus or shows the exposure, something like that? Um, you can you can punch in. So you can with there's a there's this button here. And this this was actually saving me, especially I mean, the thing is, if I was say in a in a controlled environment, you know, with the with the M lenses, then it's a lot easier to focus. But like in that Monument Valley setting when it was just the lights everywhere and, and it's it's hard to see with the sun because it's so harsh. That I would I would go. This would save me with the back screen, and I would you you press this button and it punches right in. So then you can focus easily. So that's how I was focusing a lot, not all the time. I thought it was at first. I was like, oh, it's kind of like cheating, but but then I was like, no, I need to do this. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah. So you'd hit that button, and then it 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 jumps quite far in. I think you can jump in at different stages. So yeah, and and we'll drop a link so you guys can check out the SL three and all of its specs. I know we didn't cover all the specs here, but we have them all. Available there online, all over. You can find them. We did a, a wonderful video on the SL3 for B&H. You can check that out on our YouTube. Also head over to the product page there. Danny will get that link dropped into the uh, the comment section for all of you to go check that out. But full customization on this too, right? You can you can go in, in the screen yeah. and really kind of manipulate yeah. the, the settings around how you want them. Um, you absolutely can. And look, I love this that there's not that many buttons on it so it's like compared to other cameras which have a lot of buttons and i think that is the magic of leica it's you know the, the it's just simplicity you know when they innovate it's still everything stays stays simple and, and true um so there's not only buttons but you can um change these and completely customize these so this can be your aperture that can be your iso that can be your shutter you know you can customize them however you want so i will like load my custom settings onto it so when i when i get onto it i just flick to my custom settings and it's how i remember to to use the camera and i guess awesome. in uh, yeah you can they, they can assist you in the stores and help you show you how to do that if anyone needs to needs to know definitely head to the like a store head to b and h or b and h people yeah. all over there you go people all over to answer your questions help you guys get set up a uh, huge thank you again to oliver and like for for making this happen to all of you out there for tuning in that is it another edition of the b and h virtual event space now in the books catch y'all next time Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Oliver.